We uh, come to church to think. Amen. We come to church to open our hearts and our minds to the Word of God. Uh, we, open, we come here, and by the way, we are privileged. We sometimes take it for granted to have the privilege to come to a Bible-believing church, a Bible-believing church that not only preaches it, but we live it. We get to read the Bible, the Word of the Almighty God. What a joy. What a privilege. And then we get to a book like tonight. Second Chronicles. Let's go through this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, and then 2 Chronicles. Oh, 1 Chronicles. Uh, it is broken up in three sections. If you remember 1 Chronicles, it was broken up. The first nine chapters were the genealogy. So-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so and so It's a list of names, amazing names. Then chapter 10 was uh, a description of Saul, King Saul. Then chapters 11 through 29 give the life of David, King David and all that he did. Now, uh, First Chronicles, amazing book in the Bible. Tonight we're getting to Second Chronicles, and really there's uh, two sections of Second Chronicles. Chapters 1 through 9, as you see over there, gives us Solomon, Solomon the king. And then the second half, really from chapters 10 to verse, uh, chapter 36, tells us of Judah the nation. Now, as we read this first part here in first, or Second Chronicles chapter 1, we're going to begin to see the, the King Solomon in the beginning. So if you're there, let's, let's do this just to stretch our legs a little bit. Let's stand in honor of God's Word. And let's read the first, uh, first two verses here together. We'll read these in unison. Ready? And Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and magnified him exceedingly. Then Solomon spake unto all Israel, to the captains of thousands and of hundreds, and to the judges, and to every governor in all Israel, the chief of the fathers. And it begins uh, the life of Solomon. And the rest of this chapter tells about how he asked for wisdom, and the Lord gave him wisdom. And praise the Lord, not only wisdom, but a lot more than that. And the first nine chapters, Second Chronicles, we're going to go over it, but tells us about Solomon. Here's what I want us to do tonight. Let us try to open our brains and think tonight. Let's rebel against the society of amusement. Let's rebel against a society that is amusing ourselves to death, you might say. And let's open our mind to the word of the almighty God. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And thank you for the, really, the cream of the crop, Lord. Uh, people who love you enough to come to church on Wednesday. And uh, these are people who do think, Lord, and I'm thankful to be a part of it. I pray that you help us to see Second Chronicles as not a, a ho-hum, boring book, but your word that gives us the example of lives of people who did good and in some ways didn't do so good, Lord. And I pray that you help us to think tonight. We love you. We need you. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Ah, First Chronicles, 29 chapters. In 1 Chronicles 29 chapters, we see little made great. We see the little nation of Israel made great by the Almighty God. 2 Chronicles, we see great that really becomes exceedingly great with Solomon uh, made little. By the end of 2 Chronicles, this great nation of, of Israel is divided into the kingdom of Judah, which is then conquered by the Babylonians. And oh boy, uh, this is... Uh, tremendous book. I want to look at this, if you will. You look at this. Uh, first uh, chapter, nine chapters, it speaks of King Solomon. So the first nine chapters of Second Chronicles speaks of King Solomon. Solomon. Very good. I'm going to run over here. Now, the second part of the book, which is really chapters 10 through 36, six, 36 chapters in this book, from chapter 10 to chapter 36, it speaks of Judah, the nation, or the nation of Judah. Now, we remember uh, this uh, to help our history just slightly. I'm going to bring this down right here. Oh, praise the Lord, Pastor. You're going to draw us a map. Well, I just might draw you a map here just for fun. And so here is our map real quick. We have 
Oh, boom, 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 right here. That's the Red Sea. Over here we have the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf. We have the Dead Sea. We have a little sprout out of that, the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee. We have Jerusalem. We have uh, the city of Samaria right here. And uh, David was king, king of Israel. He led the uh, nation right there to come to Jerusalem. He conquered Jerusalem, you might say, and uh, Jerusalem right here. And we're going to see that uh, during 2 Chronicles, the, uh, we'll look at a divided kingdom. After Solomon, the southern kingdom right here, the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, becomes a nation, the northern kingdom of Israel. There's a divided kingdom. We will see that as we read that. And uh, praise God for this. Look, look at this. I want to draw a chart so you just understand this. In 1 Chronicles, 1 C, 1 Chronicles right here, we say little, little, becomes great. And God takes that little nation and makes it great. Second Chronicles, we see uh, that great nation begin to go down, 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 down. Now, it didn't go exactly like that. It really went like this. Boom. And God can take little things and do great things with them. Yes, sir. Little is great, but God, little is much when God is in it. Amen. Amen. But all of a sudden, when we get the big head thinking that we are somebody that God is lucky to have us on His team, He'll take that great and make it little really, really, really quick. And that's really what happens here in uh, 2 Chronicle is lit or great becomes little again. And so let's move on right here. Look at this first chapter, if you will. I want you to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse number 7. Uh, and we're going to flip through a lot of portions of Scripture here. So it'll help you if you have your Bible. If you need to get one of those pew Bibles, that'll be a blessing right there. But verse number seven, in the night, in that night did God appear unto who? Solomon. Solomon and said unto him, ask what I shall give thee. Verse number 10, he said, this is what Solomon says, give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before uh, this people. For who can judge this, thy people that is so great? And what does he ask for? Does he ask for money? No, he asks for wisdom. Uh, does he ask for fame? No, he asks for wisdom. Does he ask for uh, popularity or an expanded kingdom? No, he asks for wisdom. Boy, you, you think about that. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Amen. And what a joy. If you can have wisdom, wow, it doesn't get better than that. Right. And often uh, in our society, we're taught to go after the wrong thing. Uh, we're taught after, to seek after fame. We're sought to seek after another friend, you might say, or another somebody to follow me on the social media, or we're taught to, uh, to make the uh, uh, big bucks. You see that all the time when you go into the grocery store or you go into the local 7-Eleven. People are trying to get rich quick. Uh, they're with their lottery tickets and so on and so forth. And they're taught that, hey, money is what we ought to seek after. No, no, no. The Bible tells us the greatest thing is wisdom, and the wisdom of God is what we should desire and what we want. Go to chapter 2, if you will, with me. Oh, chapter 2. Now look at this, chapter 2, verse 1. And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And then you look at verse 5. And the house which I build is what? Great. For great is our God above all gods. Just look at that. For great is our God above all gods. Hey, Solomon wanted to make the house of God, the temple, Solomon's temple, great because he realized how great God is. And you know, you think about that, the work of the Lord. Uh, we ought to magnify it, not because of the greatness of ourselves, but the greatness of the great God we have. Uh, our Sunday school classes are really not your classes at all. It's the Lord's class. Uh, that building that we're building over there, it's not our building. It's the Lord's building right there. And you begin to look at things a little bit different. Your, your family is not really your family. It's the Lord's family. Your children, not your children. It's the Lord's children. You look at your money. It's not your money. It's the Lord's money. And we begin to look at it and it says, and the house which I build is great. Why? For great is our God above all gods. What a tremendous verse right there. Amen. Amen. Chapter 3, if you will. This, oh, so interesting. Chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at, uh, at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. Okay, Mount Moriah. And uh, you look at this. The, uh, well, here's my Jerusalem, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. 
This is uh, to the east, east, uh, north, I'll put that, south, you got this, I barely know this right here. And so uh, Solomon's temple was built right here, Solomon's temple. The city of David would go out over this way, the city of David. The city of David was Jerusalem. In today's world, uh, the old city of Jerusalem has walls right here. This is different. It's outside the walls of Jerusalem. But in David's day, the walls would go over like this. There's the Kidron Valley right here, the Kidron Valley. And over here it goes, it's like a mountain up, up, up. So that you go down and then up right here. The Kidron Valley, there's a spring. Hezekiah's tunnel would be over here. This is what they call the Mount of olives. You get up here, this is higher, you'd be looking down over the mount right there. But Mount Moriah, he built the temple on Mount Moriah. The temple, Solomon's temple was built on Mount Moriah. Uh, we think about this, an important folk. Uh, the, uh, mount Moriah was the place where Solomon built the temple. So Solomon built the temple on Mount now, I'll read this to you for time's sake. If you want to mention it, Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2 says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham? And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And it's believed that where uh, Isaac offered up, praise the Lord, his son Isaac is the Mount Moriah where the temple was eventually built. And so it's interesting how all that coordinates right there. Then you go look at verse number 2. Look at this. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 2. And he began to build in the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. God, God gives us details in the Bible that sometimes seem so insignificant, but they're not. He tells us exactly when they begin to build things. And it's really interesting. The second day of the second month in the fourth uh, year reign. Now, it's interesting. The, the, the months had, had names. I want to give you one example of this. The second month. If you go uh, to 1 Kings chapter 6, I can read this if you don't want to turn there. But 1 Kings chapter 6, uh, starting verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, Z-I-F. The second month is actually called the month of Ziph, Z-I-F. So you understand the second month in the calendar, when it's said there in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, the second verse right there, the second month, you would know that that second month is called the month of Ziph, Z-I-F. Uh, which is a set, and it defines it, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. It's also mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. But understand, there, there's so many intricacies of the Bible, and as you begin to put them together, you'll see another one a little bit later, something that I didn't even know until recently. It's interesting. The Bible is an amazing book. I want to say that. The Bible is a joyous book to read, to study, and so on and so forth. Let's continue on, uh, if you will, to chapter 4. Chapter 4. Oh, this is interesting. He's beginning to build the, the what? Temple. Okay. Now, chapter 4. Oh, ooh, wow, look at this. It, 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 we, we read over this sometimes and we're missing out. Moreover, he made an altar of brass, 20 cubits, the length thereof, and 20 cubits, the breadth thereof, and 10 cubits, the height thereof. Also he made a molten sea of 10 cubits from brim to brim, round and compass, and 5 cubits uh, the height uh, thereof. A line of 30 cubits did compass it round about. Okay. Um, hmm. Let me see here. Uh, picture, 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 picture. Picture is worth a thousand. Let me see here. Ho, ho, ho. Okay. I want to, I'm going to take my notes right here and show you. What is this? Oh, poor church members dealing with these things. Here's a sort of a picture of Solomon's temple. And as we were reading that chapter 4 there, I got the wrong piece of paper. Um, and you notice verse number 2, and he made a molten sea of 10 cubits from brim to brim. Okay, a molten sea. Okay. You could look. 
That's 10 cubits, 10 cubits from brim to brim, okay? I'm just going to put a 10 there. You see that? Molten sea. Now look at this. And under it, verse 3, and under it, under what? The molten sea. Okay, and under it was the, the similitude of oxen, which did compass it round about, ten and a cubit, compassing the sea round about. Two rows of oxen were cast when it was cast. It stood upon twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the... Wow! Okay, so you have... Okay, and just to... So you had it holding up by 12 oxen. Three were looking this way, three were looking this way, three were looking this way, three were looking that way. That's where the priests would go to cleanse themselves before they'd offer a sacrifice. They'd go up to this sort of bath type of thing, and you look at it, you can just imagine walking up. It's very large. It gives us the description of the cubits. They're large oxen made out of brass right there. And there's three of them pointing this way, three of them pointing this way, three of them pointing this way, three of them pointing this way. But the description of Solomon's temple is amazing. It just doesn't stop with that. It tells the description of the holy holies, the holy place. It shows the labor. It shows all of that. And the intricate details that we have is amazing. And sometimes we read over something like that and don't even think about it. But think, just picture in your mind next time you read over that chapter right there and you see the, br the brass and the oxen. Oh, amazing, amazing. Continue on how. Oh, time flies. But it's exciting. Oh, oh. In verse 14, 18 of chapter 4. Thus Solomon made all these vessels in great abundance for the weight of the brass, for the weight of the brass could not be found out. You know what, what does that mean, Pastor? It was a lot of brass. <laughs> it was a lot of brass. It's, it's interesting, too, and I'm, I'm, here's a minor pet peeve of mine, okay? Their commentaries are good. People writing about things are good. But when the commentary does not line up with the Bible, believe the Bible. In reality, some commentaries will change brass to bronze, and there is a difference between brass and bronze, okay? And so we just got to say brass, brass. It says brass in the Bible. How many times is bronze found in the Bible? Zilch, none, but brass is. So I don't know why people take the liberty to change brass to bronze and bronze to brass, whatever like that. I think we ought to just stick with the book. Amen. What the Bible says, we believe. And uh, we ought to think about that. And then somebody will say, well, there's minor differences between brass and bronze. In reality, there is. But it's still brass. Amen. Let's use the word brass. Amen. And so we think about that. The Bible is amazing. A, a, a tremendous thing. Cha oh, oh, chapter, uh, ay, ay, ay. chapter 5, God's house is finished. Chapter 6, uh, Solomon begins to pray. And uh, chapter 7, go to chapter 7. Look at this. Am I okay to have a pet peeve every once in a while? That's the Bible. Amen. And uh, we ought not to add to it or change it, should we? Amen. 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 Even in the small things, because all of a sudden we change a small thing and it leads to changing a lot of big things. And, uh, you know, every little jot and tittle matters to God. And so I think we ought to keep it that way. Amen. Amen. And so in the chapter 7, the end of Solomon's prayer, look at this. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying. The fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they what? Bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord saying for he is good, for His mercy endureth forever. By the way, we, we look at worship in the Bible. Worship lowers self, and God is exalted. Amen. Worship is misdefined today in so many different ways. In today's quote-unquote worship services, we're all raising our hands and lifting up self. We go to a let's go worship God. Let's go to a worship conference. Let's go worship the Lord. 
And all they're doing, they got somebody on the stage lifting up themselves. Lifting up themselves. Look at me. I saw a list of the top uh, 10 billboards of the contemporary Christian rock music today. It's pitiful. It's just, it's just pitiful. It's just so pitiful. And it's me, myself, and I oriented. Uh, how many times was the name Jesus listed in any of those songs? Zero. It's just terrible. And the problem is, is we, we're all, not we, we, the world today, is gone anti-God, anti-Christ. When we look at worship right there, God's involved. We lower ourselves in the, the fear of the Lord. God is great. God is powerful. God is almighty. Amen. He is. Yeah. And we begin to think about the amazingness of God. Okay, move on, Pastor. Quick, quick, quick. Yes, yes, yes. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I, I want to finish. You want to go home? Let the people go. Uh, at chapter 8, you, it, look at chapter 8 real quick. Chapter 8, verse 17. In verse number 17, then went Solomon to Ezion Geber, and, and you correlate, they went to Ezion Geber at the seaside, the land of Edom, and Hiram sent him by the hands of his servants ships. And uh, you get that correlated with the first Kings chapter 9, and Solomon had a navy, okay? Uh, Solomon had a navy. I'll ruin another one right here. If we look at our little map right here, the Red Sea here, the Red Sea, with the Dead Sea right here, that's bad the Sea of Galilee, Jerusalem. Down right here at the Red Sea is a city called Ezion Geber. So, so Solomon had his navy that went as part of the Gulf of Aqaba or what we would call the Red Sea right here. It's an interesting fact when you realize it wasn't a, uh, he didn't have his navy right here. The navy he's talking about is out of Ezion Geber, which is in the Red Sea. Small tidbit, but it's interesting because every time you see the word Ezion Geber, the city of Ezion Geber, it's talking about that part of the Gulf of Aqaba. Or the, it's actually called the Red Sea there. That's Solomon's navy. Amen. Okay. Amen. Chapter 9, uh, we uh, look at the, um, oh, the Queen of Sheba. And then we turn to chapter 10, if you will. Look at this, chap chapter 10. I'm going to go through this very fast. But remember, chapter 10 turns the page into the divided kingdom. Chronicles is a chronicle of David and a chronicle of the southern kingdom of Judah. Chronicles takes place after the 70-year captivity. Uh, Chronicles is an encouraging book to encourage those people as they're done with the 70-year captivity, encouraging some uh, to understand that the nation, it, it doesn't mention David's sin of Bathsheba. It really uh, makes small, uh, it doesn't really say much bad about Solomon, his, his wives and his turning away from God, doesn't mention that. So it minimizes a lot of the negative and the bad. Okay, so when you read that, you're not going to read about David, Bathsheba. When you read the Chronicles, you're not going to read uh, about Solomon's demise. You're not going to look at the uh, northern kingdom of Israel that was bad, bad, and bad, and bad, bad, bad. Okay? It does mention a few bad things, but it's really not much on, on that scale. It's different than First and Second Kings in that way. First and Second Kings shows the good, the bad, and the ugly more focused. So the divided kingdom, it shows in chapter 10 how the kingdom was divided. He, it, 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 when you read it, it does tell him how he did not listen to the wisdom of the old men, Rehoboam, and how he listened to the other people, and it showed him how to divide it. But if you read it, it's different worded than it was in, uh, earlier in the Kings. And so we get through this, and you go to chapter uh, 10, 11, and 12, and in chapter 12, Rehoboam forsakes, forsakes God. And you'll notice real quick, we're going to go through there. The, this is going from Solomon, and it's going to go down, 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 down. There's little spigots of up with Jehoshaphat, with uh, Hezekiah, with the, uh, Josiah, uh, with Asa. Uh, but tentatively, you see that going down, 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 and downward path. Do you see that? So let me go through this. You have chapter 13, uh, Abijah is bad. You get 14, 15, and 16, King Asa, good. Chapter 17, 18, 19, uh, 20, 21, Jehoshaphat, typically good. Uh, you get to Joash, Amaziah, uh, down, down. Chapter 26, Uzziah, up, up, up. 
Uh, chapter 28, Ahaz, down. Chapter 30, Hezekiah. Oh, whoa. It, understand, we're, there's no way we can go over 36 chapters in a day. But right. I'm saying, first, Second Chronicles is an amazing book. Yeah. When you get into it, it's powerful. Hezekiah, what, I put it in the notes, what a day. They had revival, revival, revival. So much so, and se- they decided to do the Passover. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 26. Look at this. Chapter, 20, chapter 30, verse 21, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. Chapter 30, verse 26, so there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not li- the like in Jerusalem. Hezekiah brought revival back to Jerusalem, back to the Israel right there. How did he bring revival? By getting back to God. And uh, Josiah, Hezekiah in chapter 31, 32, 33, Chapter, 30, uh, chapter 33 is actually Manasseh. That's, he's a bad king right there. Chapter uh, 34, Josiah. And uh, chapter 36. and 30, I want you to go to chapter 36. And I put on this, wow, and this is going to be close to the end. We're going to get out of here within four minutes. <laughs> so hold on. Chapter 36. This, this is the end, and this is bad. Zedekiah, he was the last king, and he was just bad. In verse 14, 36, verse 14, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he, the Almighty God, he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until... Until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. That's a bad end. But you know what makes me want to be? I don't want to be a part of that people that mistreat God's people, God's word. I want to be one of those ones where I'm sticking with God. And I can see all the people around me maybe going a different direction, but I'm sticking with God. I could see maybe even other religious people, it said even the priests, the religious people, they despised God. But I'm sticking with God. Amen. And it makes me want to gravitate even closer to the Almighty God. By the way, I want our church to be that way. I want to, to lead a church that has a fire for the true God, the living God, for the truth, the right way. Yes, Don't you want to be that? That's why you're here. Yes, and we think about that. Oh, wow. Which... When you go back, and this will be our memory verse, I'll just quote it. Um, Chapter 7 gives us hope. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There's hope for wicked people because God is compassionate. God is merciful. God is loving. By the way, there's hope for me. Amen? Because of God's compassion. He's not the problem, we are. Well, let's say that verse three times and we'll be done. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. One more time. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. What an awesome book 2 Chronicles is. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you.